Genesis chapter 5. Father, we just ask now that you would clear our minds and that you would help us to understand what you would have us to learn today. Lord, you have made your word to be clear and understandable. You have filled us with your spirit to teach us. And we just ask for these things to be made alive in us right now. In Jesus' name, amen. So we started Ephesians chapter 5 last week. And we got to verse 7. And we were talking about last week, basically, divine love and worldly love, and what the difference is in those two, right? And it starts off the chapter with, be imitators of God as dear children, to, to imitate our Heavenly Father, just as our earthly children imitate us. And, and, and they, they'll try to walk like us, they'll try to talk like us. And for a while, when we're Christians, when we're right out of the box, we try to walk and talk like other Christians. And we try to hopefully, hopefully, that they're walking and talking like, like our Father. And we, we end up kind of putting our faith and trust in other people more than we do even God. We do to get saved, but then we watch other folks and we start to imitate them. And we start to adapt to them instead of adapting to our Heavenly Father. That's not good. Yeah. That, that's not what he calls us to do. 1 Peter chapter 1 says this. Starting with verse 13, he says, Therefore, gird up your loins, the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is, that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, the grace that, that you have now is being poured out on you as, as a believer, you've experienced the grace of God, but you've not experienced the fullness of the grace of God. That's not going to happen until he comes and we are with him forever, period. That'll be the fullness. When we pass through the refining fire, when we stand pure and holy in front of him, when we are like him, then, then we'll have the fullness of his grace. But that, that, is, that is yet to come. But every day we experience it. Every day we experience His grace. His, his forgiveness, His mercy is extended to us daily. It has to be right now. We're being sanctified. We're being put, up, put aside, or not put aside, but set aside, set apart is better, uh, from everyone else and from the rest of the world to look different, to be different than everybody else. Peter, continue with, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, uh, as in your ignorance, but as he who caught who called you as holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And we've forgotten this. I saw uh, an article this week that a friend of mine posted. And the, the headline of it is, I think, I'm trying to remember, as long as this lines anyways, I don't remember word for word, but has authenticity replaced holiness in the church? Now we would think that authenticity is not a bad thing, right? Being authentic, being you, not trying to be something completely different than who you are, not hiding your personality, not being, you know, fake. And that's kind of how we, how we put it out there. But that's not really what God expects of us. You don't trade that for being holy. Actually, you are to trade that to be holy. Because the Bible teaches us that we are a new creation in Christ. We're new. We saw that last week in four. Uh, to, to put off the old man, to put on the new man, just like changing clothes. So we are to be different. We're not to continue on to be the same. And, and if our personality quirks or personality bents get in the way of being who Jesus calls us to be, then they need to change. They need to change our temperament, the way we talk, the things we do, the places we go. If we're not representing Jesus Christ, and we're not honoring him with our life, then it needs to change. It's not enough for us to say, well, he called me the way I am, so I can stay this way. We can identify in that we understand what it's like to be lost. We understand what it's like to be different than we are now. We understand what it's like to not be a Christian. We understand what it's like to walk in the world. But we're not to identify with that anymore. That's not to be us anymore. We're to be different. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. Starts right out of the box with this. Right? For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. First he tells us to be imitators, 
to love as Christ loved. Now he's telling us to, to walk as children of the light. It's interesting wording there, isn't it? You were once darkness. Not you were once in darkness. You were darkness. Right? Now you're not in the light. You are light. Paul writes to the Thessalonians and tells them you're children of light. Not children in the light. Not children who are enlightened. You are light. You are a light bearer. If you go back to creation, God makes the heavens and the earth, and then he creates light. He says, let there be light, and he separates light from darkness. And then later on in creation, he makes the light bearers. He makes the sun and the moon and all the stars to bear his light. He's telling us here, we were darkness. We were dark. We personify whatever side of this we're on. If, if you are walking in the ways of the world, you are darkness. If you're walking in Christ, if you've been saved, you're light. You don't have to have anything to do one with the other. Right? Now, that's not to say we don't ever associate with or, or, or interact with anybody who's lost, because then who would we ever give testimony to? Who would we ever uh, to preach to or share or testify with if we don't interact? But our life and their life isn't to be together. You've heard me say over and over again, your best friend should not be a person who is not a believer. Because they're not going to give you godly counsel. They don't know how to. They're not going to tell you to go to the Bible and, and get your counsel from the Bible, from God's Word. That's why Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians... In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he tells us to not be unequally yoked. A believer with a non-believer. Yeah. Now you're going to go to work, you're going to work with a bunch of non-believers. I do, you guys do, we do it. You're going to go to school, maybe you go to school, you're going to go to school with non-believers. Even if you go to a Christian school or a Christian college, you're still going to go to school with a bunch of non-believers. You're going to go to a Christian college and you're going to be sitting under professors who are willing to compromise God's word and tell you that the, the classical or the uh, traditional interpretation of God's word is wrong. They're wrong. Right? They're going to tell you you can't take Genesis chapter 1 through 3 literally. Well, if you can't take it literally, you can't take the rest of it literally either. You can't pick and choose out of God's word what you want to believe. Those three chapters are written in literal language, using literal type grammar, emphatic, very specific. It was written intentionally the way it was written because it's true, not because it was a fable. If it were a fable, Jesus would have told us they were fables. Instead, Jesus verifies Moses. He verifies Noah. He verifies Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and Daniel, and Isaiah. He speaks to the Old Testament prophets and, and the kings and, and the lawgiver, the one through the, who brought the law to his people. Jesus speaks of those men as though they were real, not as though they were fake, or not as though they were made up stories. So to question them and question their existence as a believer is to call your Savior a liar. Right? Listen, you are darkness. The world is dark. That's one of the things, if you go to First Corinthians or Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, chapter six. Verse eleven. It goes right along with what we're looking at in, in Ephesians chapter five. Paul says, O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. So the Corinthian church was a compromised church. It, it had tried to minister to the world by letting the world into the church. And Paul had to address it, especially in, in 1 Corinthians. Some... some like to joke that this could have been labeled first Californians. If you've ever been to Southern California or, or San Francisco or wherever, 
this is, well, you know in our culture in the Midwest, if it happens in California about three years, it's here. Yeah. You know, that's usually where things start. So you say, you're not restricted by us. You're not restricted by the, by the instruction that Paul and the other apostles or, or the other disciples are giving. Not restricted by that. You're restricted by your own affection. You're restricted by your love for the world. You're restricted by your unwillingness to break off the ties. Verse 13 says, Now in return for the same, I speak as to children, you also be open. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So listen to this, just like you're a kid, getting instruction from a teacher or from a parent. Important instruction. Listen, if your doctor gives you instructions for treatment, you have to follow those or you're not being treated. And it's not the doctor's fault if you don't follow them. It's not the doctor's fault if it requires a life change and you don't follow that. It's not his fault. You're restricted because you think you know better than the man who went to medical school and, and is now giving you the treatment. And, and, you know, I guess in this day, I, even I will question that a little bit. When the guy sits there and punches in my symptoms into a computer and the computer diagnoses me. I'd rather go to an old doctor who's been around for a long time and seen it all and heard it all and have him say, hey, this is what I think is wrong with you. This is what you need to do. He was trained to do that. You know? I'm not any happier with mechanics who do the same thing with my vehicle because then it ends up two or three jobs later and hundreds of dollars later before they really find the, wrong pro or the right problem. But you get a guy who's been doing it for a long time, man. You turn on the key, you drive him down the road a little bit, he listens, he hears, he looks at some gauges, and he knows what's wrong with the thing, and it's fixed. Right? But listen, if you don't do what those guys tell you to do with your vehicle or with your body, then you're restricted by you. You're not restricted by them. So Paul's saying here, listen, you listen to me like you're a kid listening for the first time. And be open to this. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? Now, if you don't know what being une unequally yoked means, in the day, and in, you might see this a little bit now, being that we live in a fairly Amish community, you, you, they would hook up animals to their plows and, and to their carts, and you, you would have a team if you could afford it. And a, and a yoke was made specifically for the animal that was going to be wearing it. It wasn't made in, as a general use for every animal. It was made so it wouldn't rub on the animal. It was fit to the animal. And so if you had a team, you had to have a yoke fit to, to both. And we just read on Wednesday night as we're going through Deuteronomy that Simple instruction. God doesn't even go into great detail to it, but, you know, because we are who we are and we want to try what we want to try, he has to tell them, don't yoke an ox and a donkey together. They pull different. They're different sizes. You're never going to get the right yoke together on those two animals, ever. One is always going to want to go its own way. The other one's going to want to stop when it wants to stop. The other one's going to want to pull different and pull harder. And, and they're going to work against each other rather than with each other. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's taking that bit of the law and he's applying it to us in, here in, in Corinthians. Don't be unequally yoked together with non-believers. It just it doesn't work. Now we apply this to marriage and to dating. Definitely. Absolutely. But I'd say you should apply this to business. If you're going to have your own business and you're going to go into business with another person, it should not be somebody who believes differently than you. Because you will begin at some point to work against one another. And listen, I see it. I see it in family businesses. I see it in just friends going into business together. You know, when one believes it should go in one direction and the other one believes it should go in the other direction, they fight and they fight and they fight until the business goes down or until one of them has to leave. And relationships are wrecked. So what, what fellowship does, does righteousness have with lawlessness? What, what communion has light with darkness? 
And it kind of takes us back to Ephesians. What communion does it have? Can light and dark exist in the same place? We'll just go in a dark room, close the doors, close the windows, close the blinds. Completely dark, turn off the light and light a match. Light a candle. Does it stay dark? They can't be in the same place. It can't be. The light of a candle can be seen for a mile away. I know during the, the air raids, I believe it was in World War II, you couldn't light a cigarette in Europe during an air raid because the pilots could see it. Because they would go total blackout, all the power in all the cities would be shut off, complete blackout to try to hide the city as best they could. And you, you didn't even light a cigarette because they might see the match light or the glow off the end of your cigarette. And then they know where the city is. See, it, light is a, is a powerful thing. Light is, is, is amazing. It has physical properties. We can bend light. Right? It's not just this thing. It's not just a nothingness. We measure age by it. We can measure distance by it. So we can use it to measure things. That's one of the arguments for a long earth age, a long creation age, is that, well, these stars are billions and billions of light years away, and so, you know, the earth's got to be at least that old because it took that long for the light to get here. No, it didn't. God created light first. He created light first, and then he made the light bearers to bear the light. So yeah, they're millions and billions of light years away. But it didn't take that long for the light to get here. The light was already here. You're not darkness anymore if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. You are light. We're to be a light in a dark world. A light to the darkness. We're just supposed, we are supposed to exemplify and reflect Jesus. Not ourselves. Not our own needs, our own felt needs, or not, you know, our own desires. We're not supposed to reflect that. This is, this is what we're going to go through today and maybe not get to the rest of it until next week. This was a hard self-reflection for me this week. This is one of the ones. And every, every week, your pastor gets challenged before he stands up here in front of you guys. Every single week. But this one was really hit me hard this week. All right, So I don't say anything here glibly. I don't even feel like I should be saying anything. But it's what I'm supposed to do. This walking in the darkness instead of walking in the light. You're light. You can't. You can't. It, you can't exist that way. You listen to Sarah's testimony. Is a, a child of light trying to walk like a child of darkness, being tempted to go back to that. You know, I my kids have have shown me at different low points in my life, Jesus, like you can't believe, he speaks through your kids to you, he will. At one point, trying to get Hannah to go to sleep when she was little, and it was a particularly bad time and hard time, low spot in my life, on the verge of depression if I wasn't in a depression. And just innocent question, you know, normally you would ask, Dad, is the light in your eyes? Only what came out of her was, Dad, is the darkness in your eyes? Is the dark in your eyes? And I said, yeah, it was. But I'm all right now. Because things had just gotten better a couple of days before that. Just Jesus and me had our talk. 
challenge, and challenge accepted to change some things. And yeah, the, the, I had gotten where I was at because the dark was in my eyes. I wasn't seeing light. I wasn't acting like light. I wasn't driving darkness away. Walk as children of light. You are light, so walk as children of light. Be holy because God is holy. Holiness is not legalism. They're different. And authenticity, guys, creates a whole other legalism. It's the other end of the spectrum. You're, you're, you're asking for a whole other extreme. You know, we're not talking about the clothes you wear to church. We're not talking about if your hair is long or if it's, if it's short. We're talking about expressing ourselves in ways that we want to, regardless of how we should, because we don't want to be fake. I feel this way, so everybody should know me to be this way. And that's okay because I'm a Christian? No. You can't find anything in the Bible that backs that up. What you'll find in the Bible is change. Change. Change your ways. Right here. Walk in the light. Consider others above yourself. Consider your others to be better than you. That's what you'll find. You're not going to find, put on the suit and coat tie, or coat and suit, whatever, however it goes. So it tells you how often I wear one, right? You're not going to find, put on the tie, cut your hair, grow it long, put on the tattoos. You're not going to find any of that. That's all as fake as anything else. Now, if you're having a bad day and you need somebody to pray for you, that's authentic. But that's because you want not your day to get better, but your attitude to get better. You know your attitude needs to change. Pray for me. Not pray that it'll go easier on me and everybody will accept me as I am. It is pray that I can change and be acceptable to God. And if that'll happen, then I am representative of God to everybody else. And it's not going to get accepted by everybody else. We don't want to be acceptable. We're not in this to be acceptable to the world. We're in this to be acceptable to God. An acceptable sacrifice. Remember what love looked like last week? To give, to offer, to sacrifice. That's what love is. That's what love looks like. It's not to take and to hold on to and to, and to never let go of. To hoard is not that. It's to give. It's to, to sacrifice yourself. It's to go the extra mile for somebody else. It's to, it's to do what you don't necessarily want to do, but you do it in the name of Jesus to minister to somebody else. Well, I got a bad attitude. I don't, shouldn't be ministering anyways. I should just, you know, what? Separate yourself from the rest of the light? No. You know how many times I've started to do things that, that were ministry-oriented with a bad attitude, just I didn't want to be there, I didn't want to be doing it, and by the end of the day, by the end of the time, I'm the one who's been blessed because I followed through with what I knew was right. And when somebody else gets ministered to by that, then the Holy Spirit ministers to me and says, see, look what we can do. And in the process, I'm the one who got changed. People don't even know. People don't even, you, the people around you don't know. When you go on a missions trip, you should never just go. You go with a mission to go and to bless somebody, to do, build a school, build a house, share Jesus, whatever you're going to do. But I'm telling you, you should go expecting that you're going to be changed somehow. And go watching to see what God's going to do to you in the process of serving Him. We get this so bent, so backwards. People should do for me. People should do for me, to me, give to me. 
I'm not being fed. I'm not being this. I'm not being that. If you're not being fed in the church, man, you're probably just not eating what's put in front of you. Because you don't like it. Right? I mean, there are a lot of times when I was a kid, stuff got put in front of me at the dinner table that I didn't like. Could I go out and accuse my parents of not feeding me? Or even not feeding me something that was good for me? Couldn't. Couldn't accuse them of that. They fed me and put it right there in front of me. They even probably, without realizing it, <laughs> is really kind of a biblical principle too. You're not getting up from the table until you eat it. Well, guess what? You're not progressing in your Christian walk, in your Christian life, until you eat what God puts in front of you. Hmm? Eat it up, guys. And look, verse 9, let's, transfer, or let's transition into some food. For the fruit of the Spirit, not fruit actually as in food, but fruit as in you're producing fruit for other people to eat. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. You want to produce things for God. You want to be a Christian who's, who's achieving something. That's how you do it. You walk in righteousness and goodness and truth. I mean, isn't the world missing that? Goodness? That's not what you're told in the world to do. To be good for other people. Or to other people. To be righteous? You try to be righteous according to the word of God, you got a target on your back now. And truth, how much truth is in the world? Really, how much truth is out there? Everybody wants to twist and bend things for their own cause. And, and the church can even be guilty of that. <coughs> Pastors are, and evangelists are, are guilty of twisting and turning the word of God for the sake of the money box. Amen. For the sake of having a full crowd. The power. For some, it's gone beyond money, guys. I, I'm convinced of it. It's the power they have, the influence they have over people. That's power. That's not money. That's power. If a man says you can you can spend ten thousand bucks, give me ten thousand bucks, I'll let you follow me around for a day. And yes, there's a a pastor who has said that. You can come and follow me around for a day and be a day in my life for ten thousand bucks. Just it's not about the money, man. That's about the power to get somebody to do that. Verse 10, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. It's a walk in the light, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. A walk as children of the light, finding out what's acceptable to the Lord. For it is shame, or where am I here? Oh, verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Right. Expose the world for what it is. You don't have to go out and stand on the street corner. You don't have to have a, a nationally syndicated talk show. You don't have to have any of that stuff to expose the works of the world or the darkness. You just got to be the light. That's what light does. Light exposes everything. That's why men hate the light and love the darkness because the light exposes them. That's why bars are dark. Bars aren't light. There's no, they don't turn on light. They might flash them every once in a while, but that's just to blind you some more. Yeah. It's not light.
What does it say about Jesus in John chapter 1? Jesus is the light, right? Jesus would even say, I am. One of his I am statements, his declarations of deity, I am the light of the world. We're to walk like we're part of that and not like the rest. For it is shameful to even speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Listen, we're so desensitized to the things that the world does anymore, it's not even shameful for us to talk about it anymore. Do you feel a sense of shame anymore when you talk about the things that you see on TV, on the news that the world does? Do you feel a sense of shame of that? Or can you get on the on the Facebook and the Twitter or whatever and tweet away and bang away on their little... Well, I guess you don't bang away on them anymore. You just use your thumbs, but... You know, you punch it all out there with no thought or feeling. There's no shame because you're not face-to-face -face with people anymore. You're not worried about the sound of your voice and the things that are actually coming out of your mouth, going into somebody else's ear. We don't guard our speech anymore because we're so desensitized to it because we think our freedom of speech is on this little screen in the palm of our hand. And we don't protect our kids anymore. We don't protect them with our speech. We don't hold anything back. I mean, does it, does it make you laugh and giggle or does it cause, does it disturb you when you hear a little, little one run off a string of cuss words? Does it, is it disturbing? Or is, it, is that cute? Can you believe he said that? Well, I guess I better be careful about what I'm saying around him. How about you just be careful about what you're saying all the time? Again, little one, imitating parents, imitating adults. The little ones that run around in here are not just imitating their parents. They're imitating all of you that they run around between. Your attitudes, the things you laugh at. Is it shameful? You know, if you, if you post something that's a little off color, or, or here's the thing that gets me and has gotten me in the past, that you repost something somebody else posted that, that was kind of funny, and there's really not anything wrong with it. It was kind of funny, but then you look at the title of the guy who posted it to begin with, and the curse and the, and the disgusting things are in the title of his own Facebook page. And I've just put it out there for all of my friends and family to see. And they're not even looking at what I posted thinking that's funny. They're looking at that going, what did he do? Anybody who spends a lot of time on Facebook's done that, haven't we? Amen. So then now the question is, do you hurry up and delete that when you find it? Say, oh man, what did I do? Do you feel any shame or any guilt for it? Or are you just like, eh, oh, nobody's going to pay attention to it anyways. Move along. We're posting everything every couple of seconds. We're posting something new. Nobody will even see it. Half my friends won't, won't even find it. Honestly, guys, if this is your world right here, then you better guard it too because it's what you're known for. If it's all focused down into the thing in your hand, you better guard it. I don't have a bazillion friends like some of you guys do on Facebook. I mean, really, some of you guys have hundreds of friends, people you don't even know are your friends. Am I right? And... They all see it. It's all exposed to them. Christian and non-Christian alike. And you know what? Most of your Christian friends are going, oh, grace, they didn't, even, didn't even pay attention. God's grace on this. It's all right. Not going to worry about it. Not going to say anything about it. You know who's affected? It's you're affecting your non-Christians like going, yep, there's another hypocrite. And Yeah, they talk about the Bible on this post, and on this post, they got somebody cussing and swearing and thinking it's funny. You 
you know, listen, we really, we really, really have to be careful. Because what you think in your head, what you think in your heart, what you believe in your heart, is gone from you like that now. If you type out a message and you hit send, you don't get it back. And anymore, it's not just to the person that, that it should go to, it's to all kinds of people. We've lost some of our checks and balances. We've lost some of our, 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 our shame over the things that we say and think and do as a Christian. We shouldn't have we shouldn't have the, the things that we have as far as it, the interaction with the world that we have. You have some friends, I have some friends. Cut them off, man. If, they're, if they know they know who you believe in, they know you believe in Jesus Christ, they know you're a Christian, and, and they're going to at some point. You got to put a boundary up in your life where they can't affect you and they can't affect your kids. Because at some point it turns from you who you are and I'm who I am and let's just all get along to I know what you are and it and, and I'm I'm going to show one way or another I'm going to show that I can bring you down. Maybe you've seen the example before of somebody standing on a chair. I'm going to pull them up. I'm going to pull them up. Right? You get two guys standing on a chair, and you have a, a really big guy standing on the chair, and a little, little guy standing on the floor. And the big guy can't pull the little guy up. Just grab a hand, pull him up on the chair with him. But that little guy just gives a yank. Down he goes. Guys, be careful. Be careful the conclusions you jump to about people and about things, especially things of this world. Man, just consider it all dark. You know, some of what we preach about as being right and rights for the people, man, we might need to just let it go. Preach about what's right according to God's word. Because, uh, listen, if there's anything else out there, civil rights, religious rights, all the freedoms that our Constitution gives us, that stuff's all based on God's word. It, it, they got their, their ideas from the Bible. They weren't all Christians. Not by a long stretch. But they got their, their, their moral compass from this. It's going to get harder and harder. It's already hard here, but it's going to get harder and harder. That's some statistics that I got from, from somebody else, so be patient with me. I'm gonna, just going to share some real quick. And, and, and it's going to sound bad, because it is. But let me get to the end, because there's good at the end. All right? Of Americans, there's 84%, they say, believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. They believe he's the son of God, whatever they can understand that to be. Believe he's the son of God. But when it comes to born-again Christians, born-again Christians, it says only 33 to 45% will, will confess to be born-again Christians. And it's probably lower than that. In America, in our country, our industrialized country, per capita, in other words, uh, according to our population, 
There will be other countries that have actual more incidences of these things, but it's because they have a bigger population than we do. Percentage-wise, America, number one in single-parent homes in the world. We're number one for single-parent homes. We have the number one abortion rate, according to our population. That's not good for a nation. I mean, even from a worldly standpoint, you've got to be able to see that's not good. We have the number one rate for STDs contracted in the world, in America. Teens, 5,000 per day, they say. 5,000 teens a day in America contracting some kind of STD. With the highest rate of teen birth in the world. With the highest rate of teen drug use in the world. We have the highest prison population per capita in the world. So you take the, just the percentage of our population is what those are all based on. Compared to the percentages of the population of the other industrialized nations. We're higher than everybody else in that stuff. 60, from in the last 60 years, so from World War II on, in fact, you know, after, right after World War II, it says that 65% of our population based their biblical or their moral values, based their values on the Bible. It didn't say they were all Christians, just that they based their values. 65%. Today it's 4% based their values on the Bible. In 50 to 60 years, we've gone that far away from it, trying to get away from God. The divorce rate has doubled. Teen suicide has tripled. Violent crime is four times more. Prison population is five times higher than it was right after World War II. Children born out of wedlock, six times higher than it was after World War II. And couples living together, seven times higher than it was after World War II. The organization that collected some of these statistics made this statement. Never, there has never been a society in the history of mankind whose moral values have deteriorated so dramatically in such a short period of time as America in the last 50 years. Not in the history of men. You're to be children of light. They are dark. They're not in the darkness. They are darkness personified. When we get to the end of Ephesians, we're gonna, the last thing Paul closes out with is spiritual warfare. The war is on, man. Now, as believers, you go, man, what a way to end. And we're going to take communion after this? I'm going to end with this. With the same challenge I heard from, from the man that I heard give these to begin with. The church has two options. We get two things we get to look forward to because it get I mean, it's going to get worse and worse. We know it's going to get it's going to get bad. Is this this is, these statistics really prove out the Bible prophecy, don't they? And they say it's going to grow worse and worse. Jesus said it's going to grow worse and worse. It's going to be the same as it was in the days of Noah. He says they, they went about their business. They were married and given in marriage. They ate, they drank, they went about their business. But, the, but you go back to the, the Genesis account of Noah, what does it say? Every thought of man was evil continually. That's how it was in the days of Noah. And Jesus just said, hey man, it's going to be the same way. And what happened with that? In Noah's day, what happens? They're given warning, warning after warning. Enoch was a preacher. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. 120 years to build the ark. He preached the whole time. To anybody who would listen to him. Preacher of righteousness. What does a message of righteousness have in it? What are you, if you are a preacher of righteousness, what are you telling your friends and family to do? Turn, aren't you? Turn from your wicked ways. Come to the, be a child of light. You can be redeemed. You don't have to go the way of this world because judgment's coming. Right? That's what Noah had to have been preaching. That's what Enoch preached. 
Enoch even names his kid. When he dies, judgment. That's what Methuselah means. When he dies, judgment. But what does Noah mean? Peace and safety. So we know the judgment's coming. We know days are getting worse and worse. We have one of two things is going to happen for us as believers. Either revival or the rapture. One or the other, man. And those are great works of God. Both of them. Whichever, whichever one happens. Either revival or rapture, man, those are the only two options left. If we're going to be here, if the Lord's not coming back right soon, 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 which I believe he is, then it's revival or rapture. Either revive the church and make it viable, make it a living, breathing, word-pronouncing church of God, affecting the world again and affecting our culture instead of a culture infecting us. Or call it done and take your church home. You're right at Paul's mentality. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Right? That was how he went through ministry. That's how we go through this. Paul's day was wicked and evil too. It's on a grander scale because there's more men on the face of the earth. We've devised more ways of, of getting our evil out there and carrying it out. But the end result is that the, the, the heart of man is wicked. We have a choice. We can pray for revival or pray for the rapture. Now, I know my personal preference is like Paul's. If I go home, man, I'm in. I'm done. I'm done. I can rest. But if he wants me to be here, what do I do? I ask him to revive me. But both have to do with resurrection. Isn't it? To be able to breathe again. To move and live again. Rapture obviously has to do with resurrection. Voice like an archangel, the trumpet blows. We're out of here, we meet him in the air. Dead in Christ rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him to meet him in the air. Both have to do with resurrection. We get revived and resurrected again spiritually as a church. And begin to do what God has called us to do while we're here. And that's what needs to happen. And if you guys will begin to pray for a spiritual revival in your own heart, in your own walk with the Lord, a spiritual revival there, it'll, it'll get contagious in the church. And it'll start flowing out through the doors and the walls and the windows and everything else. Man, it'll ooze out of here like you can't believe. It'll rush out of here. It may not be accepted by the world, so what? Again, we're not called to be acceptable by the world. We're called to be righteous in the sight of God. Acceptable to Him. A holy and living sacrifice. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I could go on and on with all the things the Bible talks about. And give all the examples of how, how literal examples in the, from the Old Testament about how the temple was defiled and how unacceptable sacrifices were given. We just went through the, new, the, uh, the minor prophets in the last couple of years. We saw those things, right? Israel compromises in all the ways Paul turns around and Peter turns around and James and everybody else that writes the New Testament and says, hey, listen, all these things happen, literally happen, they happen, but they are examples to us in our life and what is not supposed to happen in us. And so, the temple of the Holy Spirit and maybe to us it's not that big a deal, but in the Jewish mind, if they go back to the Old Testament, the temple was defiled. The glory of God left the temple. We can go back to Ezekiel and see that. 
Or you can have the heart of David and want to build a temple and you want your temple to be pure and holy, a place where the Ark of the Covenant can come, where Jesus can come and sit. And he's the, his, his, his seat, his, his throne is in your heart. Where you worship in the heart. Where you worship in spirit and in truth instead of serving your own lust and desires in the flesh. And we do communion pretty much monthly. But man, you guys, if you gotta if you gotta have it as a reminder of what Jesus did, do it every day. I mean, it's taken out of Passover. The reality of is the first church probably did it once a year. They probably did it at Passover time. This shouldn't be a religious thing for us. This is a reminder. Jesus asked us, as often as you do this, do it and remember me. Don't forget me. And so I say again, like I say every week, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ and you've never given your heart to him, don't, don't take this. This is not for you. Nobody's going to think anything of you if you don't take it. it. It doesn't mean it. It doesn't get you saved. It doesn't make you saved. If you're a believer, it doesn't make you more saved. If you're a believer and you go, man, my attitude has stunk. It's been bad. It's been horrible. I haven't been walking with the Lord, not like I'm supposed to. I haven't been walking as a child of light. I don't think I deserve to take communion. You're right, you don't. Do it anyways. Take a minute. Pray. Ask God to revive you. Then get up here and take part in the communion that he set in front of you to remember what he did. That is the thing that should motivate us the most. What he did for us means that there isn't anything we can do that, that is too big and too much. He can't ask too much of us. He can't ask too much of us. He gave his heart and his, he gave his life. He's poured out his blood for us. He gave up his body as a sacrifice for our sin. So we're having the worship team come. And you guys, you guys got yours up here. Please. If you, if you feel like you're not deserving of this, don't, don't stay away. Just get things right with the Lord, man. If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That was written to a church. That was encouragement to believers as much as anything else, all right? Back in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul finishes up this little section like this. He says, But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So we don't want to get depressed by where we've been. We don't want to get repressed. We don't want to get obsessed. Whatever else you can think of to go with that. Wake up. Wake up. And walk as light because you've been given light by Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray that even as you have revealed yourself to us through your word, and even through traditions that you've initiated and handed down to us. Lord, that you, that, that we would reveal you to the world. Or that we would walk in as children of light. Not just people who are exposed to your word and to your truth, but people who live it, who are your word and your truth personified. 
Lord, you, give, you have to give us the wisdom to, to know the changes that need to be made in our life. Lord, you have to give us the boldness by your spirit to seize the moments that are put in front of us to testify. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all that you've ever done for us, especially your work on the cross, for dying for us, for calling us, for making us your own. Lord, we look forward to the day when you'll return. We pray for strength and revival to carry out the mission you've given us while we're still here. And that is to spread the gospel and make disciples. So Lord, I pray that you would call us to your, by your spirit, to your word every day. Fill us fresh and new with your spirit every day. Lord, consume us. I pray that you would be our every thought to guard us from the thoughts of our own wicked and evil hearts. Again, we love you. We thank you. We praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen.